what you're not allowed to do in sujood and please make sure that you come up with correct answers the first correct answer that we're going to receive will be the winner as well but not just that hajra i think i would want to kind of highlight the role of schools and the extracurricular sure. activities and how they always make sure that they're going to bring in some things which can actually True. earn a lot of laurels uh, mm -hmm. for the children and uh, such was an activity in uh, sas college as well so, and uh, i would certainly want you know to share the visuals over here because such activities True. will certainly provide the children these uh, platforms to kind of do well in life i mean it's and like learning extraordinarily and uh, you know for such schools to kind of uh, make sure that they are going to bring children such opportunities is something that we would love to see and, and obviously as as international school especially the eftin branch has organized or yeah, has was uh, organized an award distribution ceremony of the international kangaroo linguistic contest and obviously the chief guest happened to be our executive producers are mr jamshed sultan and who highlighted the importance of such events in any institution the principal um, mrs safia jawad appreciated the unwavering support of the teachers and parents for preparing the students to reach greater heights and bringing laurels to the institution the ceremony served as a testament to the importance of linguistic diversity the chief guest awarded the students with bronze medals certificates and other prizes and i think these uh, sort of an activities are very much important when we talk about engaging with the students when we talk about uh, having a very interactive se session with the students because um i do remember i once participated in the spelling. kangaroo yeah yeah spelling bee kangaroo competition and uh, uh, i did not qualify because my spellings were not good at that time but uh, alhamdulillah this is a very good scale to my ear that how much kids are invested in the book reading and how much spellings they are invested into right exactly i don't know whether we will certainly require the correct spellings in days to come as well but this is jamma the only right. thing which i would want to kind of speak about over here is that you know such activities are wonderful i mean children will perform and you know they will do better in life knowing that you know these are the activities that they've been involved in 
the only humble request that I'm going to make towards school administration is that whenever you are organizing such competitions, please make sure that you do not put extra burden onto the parents. You know, sir, 25,000 or more jama karein, aapka bacha ab kangaroo competition mein ja raha hai. Please don't do that. I think that the schools really need to take these initiatives on their own as well. I mean, these days, private schools, uh, alhamdulillah, are, yeah, are doing I mean, very well. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we are not in the favor of the extreme commercialization that has crept into these educational institutions because they are the nurturing nurseries uh, of the students and I think they should, uh, I mean, revert back to the institutions where they are nurturing students, True. not, you know, where they are earning money. So now, uh, Because these somewhere are the tools, la uh, ladies and gentlemen, which schools will certainly utilize to of kind course. of... You know, earn a of bit course. of money as well. Of so, course. you know, for school uh, school administrations, please make sure that when you're organizing such competitions, do not put extra burden onto the parents. Right. And, and now uh, I alluded to the fact that we are going to have the discussion on the concept of the caliphate because obviously that is the generally the rallying cry of the Muslims around the world. True. So without any further ado, we would like to introduce our guest once again. We are very blessed that we have been joined by a favorite scholar who happens to be Dr. Professor Tariq Ijaz. Assalamu alaikum, yeah. sir. And thank well, you so much once well, again thank for joining us. Well, right. And joining him, we are also very glad that we have been joined by Nath Khan who happens to be Sayyid Zulfikar Gilani. Assalamu alaikum, sir. And thank you so thank much for coming so to our show. Sir, thank right. you so much for joining us wonderful to have you over here so let's uh, start with Nate Rasool sure, and uh, then we'll certainly move on towards the concept of caliphate please <coughs> نظر آیا ہے میرے گھر راج میرا چاند اتر چاند اتر آیا ہے خواب میرا زائے رحم اے سید زیشان فقیر تیرے دربار میں بادی دائے تر آیا دربار میں لا مکان شاہ کے لیے اجنبی مکان شاہ کے لیے اجنبی مال نہیں کہ یہ مہمان عزیز اپنے ہی گھر آیا ہے
नजर आता परेशानो फसुरदा मजह रंग चेहरे का मदीने में निखर आया and I think uh, we uh, in early in the morning and especially so, since it's Juma and so Juma has its own significance so we are vibrating with the spirituality and heightened spirituality as I mentioned um, especially that we experience in the Ramadan so now kick starting our conversation and when we talk about caliphate so Shazad I was going through this anecdote which I came across that there was a person during Hazrat Ali's reign his name was Al Mughira and he did not like the caliph so what he did was he went to the Masjid al Kufa because that was at that time the capital where Hazrat Ali used to offer his sermons and offer his diplomatic activities and he started talking ill about Hazrat Ali and Hazrat Ali allowed him because he said that no he has his expression so I think that is the best example of the freedom of expression where you mm. can find such sort of expression that a person comes and from the minaret of the mosque he starts speaking ill about the ruler of that time right so uh, a lot of conversation about freedom of expression we know that uh, how much limited that freedom of expression is especially in the modern world so professor saab now let's come back to the golden age or of the khalifa rashidun or the four greatly guided caliphs yeah. so what are essential ingredients to establish a caliphate or which were there in the past Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The concept of Khilafah Caliphate, mm. it has certain important constituent ingredients. Mm. And what are those? Mm. One of the Quranic words referred in Surah Nisa mm. that states and it gives the basic principle for the formation of any form of political, political government. Ya yuhal lazina man wa atiyu allaha wa atiyu rasul wa ulil amri minkum. Number one, the first important characteristic of Khilafah is that is the unconditional, unqualified supremacy of the Quran and Sunnah. True. Uh, not contradictory to anyone. Mm. And it will play its role as a supreme law of the land. And number two is that the Caliph, he is the one who there is not, uh, not any specific form that Islam has suggested for the political governance. Mm. It can be, I mean, whatever suits our country, we can adopt into that. But the spirit behind is that, you see, that lies in the concept of Khilafah. Right. And that is, you see, the one who is going to be uh, elected as the head of the state, the basic principle of Khilafah is that he will be uh, the trustee of the whole things and the everything under him interest that will be working people, as a trust country, of the, the people. State. Mm. He is not the real honor. The real honor is Allah and, and the Prophet Muhammad means Allah. that of course you see their um, parameters given by the Holy Quran and Sunnah they are to be implemented in judiciary, in executive, in everywhere, wherever even in terms of the needs and requirements of the people for the welfare of the people, bringing the people outside starvation and then removing the economic deadlock of the poor people in all these domains, actually you see the Islamic injunctions, they have to be ensured to be implemented. This will serve the purpose of caliphate. So, so which is why I think now that we are actually having this discussion, let's, uh, you know, let's kind of have it, have clarity in our minds. Yes. Now imagine that when we refer to as uh, uh, Khilafah, Khilafat, Caliphate, what happens is that most of the times us as Muslims, we take it as a concept which was introduced to us by our religion, right? Yes. Now, that's number one. Now, for you to tell us that, you know what, it can be anybody, but for somebody to kind of prioritize the interest of the people, the state, the judiciary, and making sure that the state progress and it is prosperous as well mm -hmm. for the benefit of all of those other people. Yes. Do you think that Khalafa is a concept given to us by our religion, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or do you think Khalafa at that point of time was even the head of the state himself or herself, whoever it's going to be. Yes, of course, as I've already stated, you see this very concept of Khilafah in the context that we have been observing during the caliphate time period. It is not recommended 
through the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah of the okay. Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Because that was the time when usually globally the people, they used to have such system of the governance and the one such concept was Khilafah distinctively introduced by Islam in the early days of its uh, um, uh, so if we are So if we are to translate Khilafah in today's time, yes. you know, yes. what would we refer to as? Do, or do you think that we refer to as government, as head of state, yes. it, it as is, governor? Uh, it, it, is, it is a form of the political governance okay. mm. that it can be based on the president presidential form of government, parliamentary uh, concept based on the uh, government. Like for example, when we see the examples of two caliphs, Hazrat Sayyidina Usman Ghani and Sayyidina Ali al-Murtaza and we can find out there are sunnas of these in the lights of these two caliphs that we can choose either of these systems which be befits our country and uh, the uh, environment of and our country. And how are the two appointments like different? Hazrat, Hazrat Usman Ghani anhu, I mean for his appointment six member committee was constituted okay. for the choosing of the candidate for the caliph. When they chose, and finally they just uh, uh, an, an, another candidate was Sayyidina Ali al-Murtaza, the six member, member committee, they were divided. Their votes were divided in favor of three in favor of Ali and three in favor of Hazrat Usman Ghani. Okay. What happened when it was almost equal, then the case was referred to the parliament of Medina, which consisted at that moment 50 members, okay. 50 parliamentarians of the Islamic State of Medina. When this case was referred, and similarly, voting started over there, again 25 members voted in favor of Sayyidina Ali and 25 in favor of Sayyidina Usman Ghani. What happened next? Then the parliament decided just to hold the general election and then for that Sayyidina Abdurrahman ibn Of he was appointed as the chief election commissioner and then three days were given to him to go people to people to the common people, the ladies and the gentlemen, those were all adults, male and female members and finally after the majority of the opinions when they were given in the favor of Sayyid Usman Ghani, so this is how you see he was just elected but, as the third caliph of yeah. Islam. But Professor, we see that if we reflect and ponder over the modern system which is the nation state system, yes. right? So we have 52 or 53 Muslim yes. states right generally and they the, and those are organized over the mm. capitalist economies yes. their armies are organized according to cross with the principles mm. and obviously the political system generally they follow is generally the liberal mm. political system which was established post world war two mm. but if we reflect and think back over the concept of ummah or the concept of caliphate we see that Muslims anywhere around the world has the same rights and yes. responsibilities. Yes. We are there in the West, we are in the North, South, anywhere in the world, right? Yes. So do you think that in the modern nation state system and the caliphate system, there's a bit of a clash? How can we reconcile these both systems and make sure that the plight of the Muslims, because generally this is a rallying cry of yes. the Muslims around the world, that we need to have a caliphate, we need to revert back okay. to that. And where do you model. think that clash lies? Let's Basically, highlight that as well. This, uh, the modern concept of politi political nationhood, the concept of political yes. nationhood, basically it is, we can find out the same roots from the constitution of Medina okay. as well. Mm -hmm. Why? Because one of the articles of the constitution of Medina, out of 63 articles, it states, this, uh, defining the Muslims and the non-Muslims of the city-state of Medina, Holy Prophet Wasallam declared them, inna ummatum wahidatum min dun in nas. All these people living under the shelter of Islamic State of Medina, they are whether they are the Jews or the Muslims or any community or the small uh, tribes, those who are working in political and social alliance with the major Jewish tribes of Medina, since they agreed to uh, be with the uh, Prophet ﷺ and accept the rules and regulations of the Islamic State of Medina, so with their territorial limitations, they developed a political nation. Okay. So there is a concept that uh, there is uh, not not something that we can't say that there is any contradictory this concept the modern concept of political nationhood it is not something okay. yes of course when we talk on the larger scale about the unity of the ummah so there are certain higher objectives that as the ummah whatever duties and responsibilities laid down by the Quran and Sunnah what we are supposed to do not only for the betterment of Muslim ummah as well as for the betterment of the whole of the humanity this becomes overall the duty and, and, and thank you so much for saying that that not just for the betterment of of the entire ummah but for the betterment of the community and the mm -hmm. people who are around you as well yes. right. now very quickly sir you know because we're short on time you have to be uh, at your university you know for all those students so we're not going to take longer but towards the end the only uh, question that i have is that these days you know there's always a hue and cry for the manifestos and whether they have been fulfilled or not was there a reference do we get a reference of that as well that 
if you know you know we were to kind of talk about hazrat usman e ghani or hazrat uh, ali al murtaza mm. that they had manifestos that okay if we come into power this is what we going to do for the umma and for all of these other people now with so much of development we do see that a lot of external forces have an impact on the electoral reforms as well so how do you think that used to work back in those days basically uh, that was the time where the people they were not power hungry even you see this trust it was almost so important that they were most of the time they were afraid just to take up this responsibility they were not you see in order to just like you see lying in order to represent and manifest their own manifesto for <laughs> getting the uh, um, attraction of the people mm -hmm. rather it was you see behind them in their mind as yesterday we quoted sayyidna umar bin khattab radhiyallahu ta'ala when he stated i am the weakest amongst you in the sight of allah almighty same was the case of hazrat usman e ghani he said that i'm really i'm soft towards the people and they were all the time afraid of you see how they will be fulfilling their duties and responsibilities towards their people yeah. and working for the welfare for the uh, bringing the downtrodden segment of the people and then ensuring their prosperity in the state so this was their prime task and they have been committed to perform it and they have uh, uh, legislated certain rules and regulations in order to ensure all those under 12 provinces later on because at the time of sayyidina umar there were a political division it was the provinces were divided into eight and later on uh, sayyidina usman ghani radhiyallahu anhu further expansion when it took place then the further uh, eight, four more provinces they were yeah. added so overall you see it was the federal form of government working from capital madina and the rest of the 12 provinces they were just just like the provincial autonomy and certain other rules and regulations so, so it was always the interest of the people and the state you know which was always yes, you know almost. kind of prioritized yeah. as well. Well, and and I people think that's included exactly. all of the people, so you know they were very particular about the diversity and True. the inclusivity, right? True, and I think the Muslims. Yes, and, and I still believe yes. that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam actually did make an announcement that you know that people who actually want to go to their whatever uh, way of praying that they had that they were allowed to do so as well. True. So that was the concept of inclusive uh, community as well. But thank you so much, Professor Sahab, for thank being with so us. Much. Thank you so much, Mr. Syed Al Fakhar Ali Sahab, for being with us. It thank was wonderful so to be in conversation. For everybody who's out there, ladies and gentlemen, you know it's not a coincidence. I think that you know our entire team you know they truly deserve the credit that they planned it in such a way that we now will actually have somebody who at a very young age have been contesting for the provincial assembly mm -hmm. you know what was her manifesto why did she actually wanted to be out there to represent her community she hails from buner we will be on con con in conversation with her True. and so to make sure that she don't go anywhere we'll be right back good morning good morning and uh, she is a uh, doctor suvera prakash assalam alaikum and thank you so much for coming to our show assalam thank right. you doctor suvera it's wonderful to have you over here and you know for somebody who's a seed in khyber pakhtun khwa and that too from buner i mean we you know this is the part of information which everybody would know and you know uh, you had a very uh, famous slogan what bachao work work i i think if that's what it was <laughs> if i'm not wrong was it this one Word bachalo work away. Word bachalo work away. And you know, while I was looking at the videos of you doing your election campaign, it looked like as if you know there were massive following. People were after you. Why in the first place for you to become a doctor first? You know, spend all of your father's money in the medical college and then come to the political scenario. Why did you choose to do so? Uh, basically, I wanted to become a doctor because I was inspired by my father. Uh, he's a doctor my by father. profession. Uh, he used to help the poor people. He would uh, treat them for free. He would even give, give the medicine for free. So uh, I wanted to help people. Uh, I thought uh, as a doctor I could do that. But uh, when my, I was practicing uh, my medicine, uh, I saw there were uh, a lot of uh, bigger problems uh, and especially uh, challenges uh, that uh, the poor and women were facing in the government hospitals. Um, and uh, uh, because of lack of facilities, the patients were also suffering and that would result in them getting frustrated on the doctors. True. So it was uh, like uh, uh, a problem for the doctors and the patients 
for both. Uh, and uh, as a doctor, uh, even if you uh, get the grade 20, uh, you can't solve these problems. You, uh, you have no power or influence to, uh, you know, uh, bring the facilities to the hospital or uh, yeah. anything like that. Uh, other than that, uh, I felt really uh, helpless uh, when uh, mm, uh, the, you know, the crucial patients would come uh, mm -hmm. from the accident into the emergency and they would uh, say, uh, you, um, we have to refer you to, you know, Peshawar or uh, true, Islamabad. True, 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 true. Uh, the, uh, every minute counts. In medicine, every minute counts. So uh, I felt really ha helpless. Exactly. So, you know, that yes. cannot be the only reason for you to kind of say that, okay, you know, I wanted to mm -hmm. contest in the general election so that I could bring back some good medical facilitation for the people, even though that your thought is very noble. Mm -hmm. And this certainly needs to be done, you know, elsewhere, all over the country, where in rural areas we do have such problems. God forbid if somebody is ill in Mandi Bahawaldin, they would only refer them to law. Certainly, I think that, you know, this is a point that we really need to think about. But other than, you know, uh, uh, general well-being, you know, it's the infrastructure, it's the schooling, you know, it's the legislation yes. bit of, you know, any political figure that gets them recognized in the international arena and how they have performed. So other than, you know, you know, bringing medicinal facilities to mm -hmm. Bonaire, what other objectives did you have while you were contesting in the elections? Uh, education. The um, illiteracy rate is quite high, especially of the girls in my district. And uh, other than the environment, we have a problem um, with water and air pollution uh, because there are a lot of uh, marble factories there. Yeah. Okay. And uh, they use the, you know, old techniques uh, and uh, people die quite often True. in uh, there as well mm -hmm. uh, and um, I could choose uh, to you know uh, just submit my documents for the reserve seats but uh, I heard that I got to know that uh, there was uh, never a female uh, contesting from uh, District Bunir. Yeah. So, um, you know, I felt like it was a, a challenge. It was uh, something to be done. But I now are you reconsidering that? I'm sorry, are you reconsidering that? Because imagine that, you know, if you were to be kind of nominated on a reserve seat, you might be in the parliament now or in the provincial assembly. But for you yeah. to kind of go out there and contest and making sure that you're going to stand on what you just mentioned that you know gender equality as well do you do you believe in it do you and, think and that also you know? i'm pretty sure the the environment of Bunir is very dis different from the islamabad because pakistan have oh. a different subculture is it right? encouraging or not obviously and when you were campaigning there were lots of challenges i'm pretty sure that you have encountered so can you relate to us your journey how was it campaigning there what were some of the problems opportunities or distinct uh, environment that you encounter in, in that elections and what are some of the learnings I would uh, I like to ask you that you learn from uh, there? Honestly, when sure. I was uh, um, uh, submitting my documents for the general mm -hmm. elections, I was uh, like, uh, I heard this hesitation in my mind, like who would vote for me, uh, nobody knows me, uh, what will I do? everything like that right, right. Uh, but uh, then I thought uh, as a candidate for reserve seat mm -hmm. people won't know uh, me mm -hmm. there wouldn't be that much exposure True. as much in the general mm -hmm. elections mm -hmm. so I thought I could at least I can make an effort to bring uh, you know some uh, sort of uh, to decrease this uh, in, uh, equality this gender gap uh, right. through general elections mm -hmm. so um, I uh, contested. It was really, you know, a remarkable journey. Um, it uh, literally altered all the stereotypical approaches and media portrayals over of my uh, district because right. it is quite accepting. The people there are quite accepting and uh, quite di diverse. So it showed to the world uh, to some extent. I, I have played uh, a role in this and I'm proud of the uh, and wonderful and I think your failures are your biggest teachers right so if you uh, think that you know if you, you are so you can always tweak the strategy according mm -hmm. to that and I'm pretty sure you have learned a lot in your this journey of the uh, political processes but now let's move to your social activism and you talked about how it's hinged around the healthcare system and you are often interested in the education reforms as well um, so far obviously there's a very distinct environment or a different sort of environment, a very particular environment in a Bune mm -hmm. district, right? Um, so do you in the future you want to venture into the education and if so, what are your plans uh, through which you want to take or change the environment of that particular area? Uh, I think uh, I will. Uh, I my first uh, cho choice and my first step would be to try to uh, help the poor. Mm -hmm. uh, my plan was uh, uh, 
to uh, do it uh, through Benazir Income Support Program right. uh, because uh, there are people, um, entire families depend on uh, this uh, uh, program. Right, program. So uh, if their, uh, you know, um, monetary um, hesitations mm -hmm. uh, become less, they can send uh, their children yes. to the schools. Yes, yes. Um, even in government uh, hospitals, they have to uh, pay for the traveling. Uh, they mm -hmm. consider it a fee. So they uh, hesitate to send their children. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest issue. Mm -hmm. uh, um, then we have for the girls, mm -hmm. we have only uh, a few uh, schools and only one college uh, in Bunir, right, right. government college. And when I was studying uh, my school in Bunir, uh, there was only one private school where uh, we could uh, study uh, right. the books in English, the science uh, mm -hmm. and all that. So uh, there are quite a lot to do, like a lot. And, and we would certainly want to wish you best of luck as well. Right. But now this is where the interest, uh, the conversation is going to get really interesting. Now imagine that you know that Alhamdulillah that you were able to represent a political party which happens to be the oldest you know so remembering uh, late Bhutto Saab as well and not just that Bibi Motarma and I think that the legacy continues to live in where you know Bilawal Alhamdulillah has served as the foreign minister for our country too now what I would want to ask you is that for somebody who was not known to the people you know was able to score a ticket for herself for provincial assembly and wanted to contest the election we've mm -hmm. spoken about it how was it when you went on to the ground? How was it received by the people? You know, the that mm. cult that Pakistan People's Party has always had. You know, or any political mm. party would have that. You know, they will always have that following. So how was it that when they saw such a young, talented, uh, amazing lady who wanted to work for the people of Bunei, how did they receive it? And was it difficult for you early on to, you know, give those speeches just the way the political leadership does every single time they inspire, they influence people? Were you able to do that? Or, what, or did you have to do, go through a lot of hard work, writing it at night and then delivering it in the morning? Uh, there was hard work, <laughs> yes. But uh, the thing is, um, I got a quite an edge being a female and minority I think uh, it gave me an edge because uh, as soon as only one article was uh, published about my um, me contesting in the elections the people of Bunir supported me so much that uh, that article they're everywhere on YouTube there are articles everywhere yes. on uh, you know about you I mean and, people and, and are not chanting just the slogans national media, international media has yep. also covered it so that was uh, I mean a very very big news uh, but Dr. Saibov we've seen that um, politics is I think a 24 by 7 job mm -hmm. it requires a lot of energy it requires a lot of time and it requires a lot of patience also but uh, at the same time your um, field of medicine it also requires a lot of True. energy a lot of time how do you balance between both of them do you feel that when you're engaged in the politics your uh, profession is uh, suffering or other way around if you are in the medicine you know the politics is suffering how do you balance the very fine line between both of uh. demanding professions uh, I'm uh, like uh, not focusing on the medical part uh, okay. no, for yeah. now okay. um, because sense. as okay. you said uh, politics uh, needs to 24 and uh, 7 time so mm -hmm. um, like uh, uh, for now I have uh, joined a CSS Academy oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, it will help I hope that so if it not will a political help. leader you want to be a civil, civil servant, servant. Yes. and kind right. of contribute towards your cause is beautiful but so bringing the conversation back and thank you so much Haja for you know right. kind of asking that question because that kind of sorted it out for her as well. So now you come down to, okay, I'll come back to this. But I want, uh, because this is where, ladies and gentlemen, I said earlier that it's going to get interesting, and that is that, so you, uh, Alhamdulillah, are a daughter to a Christian mother and a Hindu slash Sikh father over here in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Bune. Now, you know, for somebody, because you just mentioned yourself, which is why I remembered this, that, you know, as a minority contesting an election, did you ever feel like a minority, you know, for example, if you have to talk about Bunair or in Pakistan, and do you think that, you know, if you would have won the election, you would have done something to eradicate these gaps in between? Because Qaeda Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah, mm -hmm. you know, I've always kind of reiterated that you're free to go to the temple, mm -hmm. you're free to go to your mosque, you're free to do whatever you want to do in the motherland we call Pakistan. Please. Uh, no, I didn't feel like a minority at all because uh, I never got uh, discriminated as a minority uh, in Bunir. As a girl, as a female, yes, totally, but as a minority, never. Okay. And uh, there is this uh, political philosopher, Ibn Khaldun, I think, yes. uh, who said for Asabia, you know, a group of people, uh, like-minded people, uh, they, uh, you know, um, need, uh, the first thing for them is bloodline. Mm -hmm. Religion comes second. Yes. Uh, I am a 
Pashtun girl. Right. People accepted me as a Pashtun, yeah. Pashtun and as a what Pukhtana. Right. That's why they, uh, you know, uh, bestowed me the, the title of Daughter of Bunir and even uh, the uh, title uh, Daughter of Khabar yeah. Pukhtunkhwa. Yeah. So uh, that was, uh, they literally, I got so much support, so much love, mm -hmm. I could never ima imagine that uh, I'd be. But mm -hmm. you know, there's a reason why I kind of asked you or posed mm -hmm. you this question. The reason is that. <coughs> You know, for the kind of life that I've spent, I've come across a lot of political figures and I've seen a lot of political figures mm -hmm. using <coughs> a lot of, sorry, emotional uh, tactics, a lot of, uh, unfortunately, religious tactics, a lot of sort of right. tactics which they thought that, you know, is going to get them a lot of vote, vote back. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine that, you know, if I am to say that, you know, people would say rather stuff which is probably not true, but just because of the fact that they want to garner so much of attention, they would use it as a card, mm. right? Because they a religious touch, bhi de de, thoda sa ye wala touch bhi de de, you know, and people do it, you know, so, so that they, because they're hungry for votes. Now, this is something which I would want to kind of appreciate over here, that you've been so honest about your political campaign, that rather than using your card, you didn't do that, because you already had this vision that you want to work for the betterment of the country mm -hmm. rather than deteriorating the image itself. So congratulations to you, first of all. I want to give you a big round of applause because you truly have those leadership skills. Now coming back to where you said that you want to join the academy, why would you want to join the academy? Why not still contest the elections or probably you know, get, a, get your name listed in the reserve seat you know, so that you can come into power, deliver, and then you can contest later on. So why are you giving up on your dream or being a member provincial assembly or member national assembly uh, i'm not okay i will be trying uh, mm -hmm. my best to uh, do something for the people something for humanity mm -hmm. uh, uh, as a politician power pakistan try hogi inshallah to matlab css ke through through css or uh, through uh, politics i will be trying to help people but, but, but dr saiba i'm pretty sure when you were campaigning on the ground say you because you are someone who has a lots of ground experience when we are talk about the women political participation on the ground right and we have lots of discourses and discussion on what needs to be done when we talk about um, having a broader political participation of the women not just in the form of the women contesting the election mm -hmm were also women who are going and were voting out for their mm -hmm. candidates out there so some for someone who has a very extensive ground experience what, where do you think we stand in this entire conversation of women's uh, political participation and what further needs to be done when we talk about the women empowerment um, I have noticed that uh, you know uh, I can't answer this uh, uh, about uh, the entire Pakistan. Sure, sure, I sure. Can, but uh, Buner, yes. talk about uh, Haber Pukhtunkhwa or the yes. rural uh, tribal areas of, yes. um, like Buner. Yes. Uh, the women, no matter how much I try to you know uh, uh, do the door-to-door -door -door campaign, uh, go to women, talk to them, encourage them to mm -hmm. go out and vote. Mm -hmm. Not for me, but go out and vote. Mm -hmm. That didn't. So uh, there are uh, still limitations and mm -hmm. hesitation, as I said before, uh, n no women <coughs> had contested for uh, District Bunir. So uh, I will try my best to, you know, bring some change step by step, slowly. And, because and, and do, you, do you think that, you know, it's probably because of the environment, culture or the men of that particular area? Because I think, you know, for us of to course. kind of come and talk mm -hmm. about how women were not mm -hmm. probably, whether they were willing or not is a different question, mm -hmm. but whether they were allowed or not is a different question. So how do you think that you would be able to change the mindset of the people that would really need to liberate the women uh, population of Buner and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and liberate in a way where we certainly stay close to our religious values, our cultural values, but let us allow women to kind of contribute towards the economic prosperity towards the general well-being of the entire community for the roles that or the be their own decision make. maker yes, right yes, so yes. decision maker is the key word here yeah uh, uh, from my own experience sure. uh, the uh, i've got uh, m more support from the males uh, b uh, because uh, like uh, I read my comments uh, by myself, I read my messages by myself and uh, I've got like so much support from the males of Bunir mm -hmm. uh, and they would uh, even uh, during the election time, um, campaigning time that <coughs> they would uh, come and uh, tell my father and me that uh, we have never let our women go out and vote but this time we will be uh, m making them uh, go out yes, and right. vote for sure. So uh, like it's step by step slow change. So, uh, 
And I'm, I'm pretty sure you belong to a family. So your father is um, a doctor himself, and he's also a social activist. And so activism, we can safely say, runs in your blood, right? Mm. So, so um, how supportive was your family? Because I'm pretty sure there must be highs and lows mm. when you were campaigning. So it's not a very uh, fine journey. It's a rocky journey. And there are times when you feel like giving up, right? So how was your support system at that particular time? Because obviously, when you talk about the uh, environment of the Bonaire, it's very different from Islamabad, from Karachi, mm. from the urban areas. It has its own sets of particular culture or distinctiveness, right? Well, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So please go ahead, talk about it. Uh, they supported my decision, as uh, as you mentioned that my father, you know, spent uh, a lot of money on me uh, on my medical education, <laughs> and uh, when I decided to contest uh, okay. general elections, uh, <laughs> he, he knew that I'll be leaving medicine. Right. So he supported me mm. back then when uh, I was submitting documents. Uh, he went with right. me. He helped me with uh, all that, and throughout the campaign, he was by my side all the time. So uh, m my family was very supportive. Uh, you know, uh, my cousins uh, were not as much supportive. Mm. They were like, uh, "What are you doing? Uh, you are a Pakhtun uh, girl. Uh, you are going out. You are uh, sitting in the car, waving to the people." Like, yes, yes. What are you political doing? figure. You know, political leaders. So the cousins really need to kind of, you know, kind of tone down the. I mean, I don't want to refer to it as jealousy, but I mean, you know, it's your cousin, Patriarchy, your sister, yeah. Yeah, you know, who's out there. Please let her do that. I think it's wonderful. Very quickly towards the end, there's one simple basic question which I'm going to put in front of you. You can think as much as you want before you answer it. Charlie Chaplin once said that you only need power when you want to bring harm to somebody. Now, for you to be in power and for, to be, for you to be out there, how do you think or why do you think that you really need a lot of power or you really need to be a part or a member of provincial assembly to do what you want to do? Rather, being a doctor yourself, you can help millions of people out there just like your father has been doing. Uh, power corrupts. Yes. There is no doubt in that, but uh, you know. Um, my parents have, you know, instilled the values of compassion and, uh, uh, you know, a sort empathy, of hum yes. humbleness, mm. empathy. Humility, yes. Uh, so uh, I don't think, I have hoped that I wouldn't be corrupted by power. <laughs> and I really, uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, a motiva um, an inspiration. My inspiration always was uh, Mother Teresa because uh, when I was... Uh, uh, later, uh, my uh, I asked my father that uh, when I grow up, what will I become? Yeah. I would ask my father yeah. about it. Uh, he would say that um, uh, you uh, aspire to become like Mother Teresa. Oh, sure. So uh, that was my goal always from childhood. That's why I think that maybe I wouldn't be corrupted and <laughs> I will be able to help people. Inshallah. But thank you so much, uh, you so Dr. Much. Samira Prakash, uh, for being with us. It was lovely to be in conversation with you. We want to wish you best of luck. You're the daughter of the Swahili, you're the daughter of the country, you represent the entire country. Thank you so much for being Thank with us. So and may Allah be with you. And, you know, however you pray for yourself, I think, you know, please make sure that you know, it goes that way as well. For everybody who's out there, it's the Jamma time now for us to kind of wrap it up as well. For everybody who's out there, it's Jumma today. Please make sure that, you know, that you take our names, you know, Hajar Asati, Shahzad Khan, Sayyid Rabbani, Jamshed Sultan, the camera team, everybody in MCR. Pray for us, you know, because every single day we get up with one mission and that mission is to make sure that we bring you a lot of information, knowledge, that too, packed with a little bit of entertainment. Until next time, look after yourselves. Astaghfirullah, Rabbi bin Kulli Zambin, wa atubu ilahi. Juma Mubarak.